Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm glad. I'm glad to be here again this year. Um, thank you for waiting. Um, I have uh, good news for most of the audience. Um, the news is that this is not a talk about VMs. So <laughs> probably most of you are going to get. But but I have good news for the for the ones that want uh, VM stuff, which is that I did this work uh, for working on B VM. So you might find it interesting for your own VMs. So I think there's work for everybody. OK, and uh, now, um, well, my name is Javier Primas, and I work for Palantir Solutions in Brie Project, which is a Smalltalk implementation, uh, which is uh, written in Smalltalk, and it's very interesting. And I'm going to talk about this uh, runtime, this, this framework that uh, can be useful for working with runtimes that are crashed or maybe not crashed, but remote, or we'll see. And before starting with the, the work itself, I want to talk about something that I'm very happy that the community, I guess, is seeing because there were many talks about doing remote programming and stuff like that, is that we as small talkers used to, uh, to think, to believe that uh, we would make our programs work on a desktop, yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah, on a desktop uh, environment, and that's not true anymore. We only are going to use desktop environments, probably just as developers. Our, our code is going to run in many platforms, it's going to run in smartphones, in many uh, very small computers, maybe servers. So we shouldn't assume that we are going to always be uh, running on a desktop. So we, we should make our tools work uh, and be deployable to places where we can debug them after deployment, right? Um, well, that's just something I'm happy about that we are seeing. And well, OK. What are the ideas behind B? Um, well, this is a, a graphic of a typical virtual machine implementation where you have a separation be between some low-level concerns, concerns and some high-level ones that are, in Smalltalk, for example, uh, reified. Like, you have meta-objects like classes, methods, method dictionaries, but in the end, you have a virtual machine that provides you for many functionalities that you cannot see, which are primitives, which are the, gar the garbage collector, the JIT, or maybe the, an interpreter. So there's a lot of stuff that you cannot see. And the idea behind B is to refine all those concepts in Smalltalk and be able to observe them, inspect them, modify them, and do understand them in the end. And that's the main idea. So what's the problem with doing what we are doing in B, what, uh, I mean, not the problem, but we, we found the problem, which is the following. When you call in Smalltalk, you call within the environment, right? And if you use your typical approach for VMs, you call your VM outside the environment, right? Which is, at both times, it's an advantage and a, and a disadvantage. Why? Because if you are calling outside your environment, basically you are modifying it, and modifying it you are, uh, is not going to make you, your VM crash because it's actually not running. And if you are working within your own environment, making changes to kernel objects may, might, may, uh, might make your VM crash, right? So when you are modifying your VM, uh, in a low-level typical approach. Um, well, I refer to low-level as anything that is not small dog. Maybe that's not low-level, but OK. Uh, well, in, in the case of low-level, you apply your changes after recompiling and restarting your application. And in the case of V, you code within the environment even the garbage collector, the JIT compiler. And then if you do even a silly mistake, then you can uh, crash, right? 
your changes are applied immediately, so your, your environment might crash immediately. So let's see what is the, the workflow we have when, when, developing, when developing B. Basically, we have this runtime, which includes every part of the system, and where everything is reified, and you start doing changes, right? You change the running system. And maybe you make a mistake, and then the system crashes, right? So how do you debug that? Because if, if you made the system crash, you cannot use your own debugger. You have to do something else, right? So the idea is to have another runtime to launch another runtime, or maybe use another one that you already had, and use that runtime to debug the original one. Um, so well, let's let's see um, how we can do that, right? So consider that we have two different processes which are disconnected and now nothing one of the other, right? The, the image that has crashed doesn't know anything about that it is being debugged and the one that is going to debug it uh, doesn't know anything about the running image that crashed, but only that it is a, pro it, it is a process in maybe in the same machine, maybe in a remote one, but it's only a process that it can access via some kind of API. It could be the uh, operating system API, it could be, for example, GDB uh, interface, maybe box, it could be anything. So the way to debug uh, the approach that we took was to reify the concept of the runtime, right? The, the runtime system, this little object. Can you see? Can you read? Yeah, I guess, more or less. Use your imagination. OK, you have this little object that represents a remote runtime, right? A remote in the sense that it's not in the current process. It's in, a, in another process. It might be in the same machine, but it's remote because it's not, the objects there are not living in our own image. And with this little reification, we are going to actually create a bridge, which is an object that is going to let us access the remote object, objects in the other image. So, and, and what is one of the interesting parts of this is that we could make our, our image generate a lot of information for uh, the operating system. For example, if you compile a native program, you can generate a meta information, dwarf it's called, for, or maybe uh, in, the, in Windows it's, it's a different kind of meta information about what's within the, the program you compile. But if you're using a small talk image, you have all the meta information already inside the image. So even if you could generate more information, more meta information, you already have it. So generating it again is not that useful. You could use what you have already. And so with your bridge, you could, for example, go and look for the PE header of your file, or maybe your ELF header of your file, and just use it for finding a very well-known object like NIL. It could be any object, actually. Because as we have a metacircular runtime, from NIL we can find its class, we can find from its class its superclass, we can find everything, right? So let's, let's see how it works. If we get NIL, we can get actually the address of NIL from, the, from this table that is in every executable in our image, in our debuggy. We can find actually the object. We can access the object, right? And this object, is going to be accessed through a kind of little object, which is a handle, which actually only knows the address where NIL is stored in the remote image. And if we can access NIL, then we could, for example, create what is called a mirror for objects. Mirrors are a, a, a kind of, uh, you can consider it like a external reflection on, on objects is reflection that is not uh, implemented in the object themselves like we used to have in Smalltalk, but externally. You ask the, the mirror 
what are the properties of the object that it's mirroring. So in this case, we can ask the mirror, for example, for the class of the object we are referring to. And this is going to give us an undefined object class, right? The, the class undefined object. And if we access the class undefined object, we could create a handle for that, right? And with that handle, we could create a class mirror for that, for that class. And if we have a class mirror, then we can ask the class for its superclass, which is object. And if we have a handle for that superclass, we can also ask object for, for example, its subclasses, one of which is small talk system, right? And if we have a the class Smalltalk system and the handle to that, then we can also ask the Smalltalk system. This is a, a, a bit of a simplification here. Maybe there are some objects missing in the, in the diagram, but most of them are there. Um, so if we have a Smalltalk system, we can, uh, we can ask for the current one, and the current one has all the globals, and the globals have anything that we need. For example, it could have the class process, or maybe we could ask for the class process or find the class process as a subclass of, of object and then we can find the current process and we, call, we could follow this procedure to find any object that we wanted to, to access, right? Uh, how do you get from object to model system? Just uh, by looking at the subclasses? Yeah, that could be the way, yeah. I, actually, I don't remember how I do it but I'm, it's probably like that. Okay, so if we have the process, we could create a, a mirror for the stack and we could, for example, start looking at all the objects that are in the stack in the current process, in the active process. And if we are debugging a crashed program, that is going to be the most valuable information about our remote image. And, well, this is a very nice approach and it's an approach that allows us to get a lot of information, but this information is structural, right? Because we are not actually executing anything. We, we can see the remote image, but we are not sending messages to the objects in the remote image. And as we know, uh, most of the stuff implemented in objects are actually uh, things that are hidden from us, are encapsulated. So if we want to get information from remote objects, we should try to access them through their typical interfaces, which are the methods that they provide. So if we had an object, then the question would be, how could we send a message to, to that object? If we have the handle, how, how can we send messages to those objects? Okay. And so that's the metaphysics framework, basically. Um, so consider now that you got, you got this debuggy with a, a small array, one, two, three. You got a handle for it, and the handle usually points to its reification of the runtime, the remote runtime, runtime. And what we have is a kind of proxy, right? But if we have a proxy and we said, okay, sum, we said to the proxy sum, but what should the proxy do? Should it execute that sum remotely? If the, pro if the process crashed, that would be maybe dangerous because we could, we could lose information or it could make it crash again, right? Or maybe the process didn't crash, we are just debugging it, so we could execute it remotely. It would be a, a good approach in, the, in that case. But maybe we want to ex simulate the, that execution locally in our local image. Right? We could simulate that we are executing the message or the method, the implementation of some in our local image. But in that case, we could also ask, are we going to simulate it with the call of the remote image or with the call of the local image? Because we have some implemented in both images, right? There are many possibilities. And the interesting thing is that we cannot know beforehand if we are going to need one approach or the other approach or which approach. So it will be interesting to have a framework that lets, uh, let us 
send messages to the objects and choose if we want to do any of these kind of executions, uh, depending on our needs. And so we have this little variation of a proxy, which is a subject. A subject only knows one thing, what is called a gate. And basically, a gate is something that uses, uh, but that basically is a, is our choice of execution of semantics on the methods that are going to be executed on the subject, right? So the subject is a, a very thin object. It's, it has almost nothing, and it doesn't understand any, uh, anything. So each time it gets a new message, it dispatches it through the gate. So we can change the gate or create a new kind of a new subject with a different gate for the same handle and execute the messages in a different way. So uh, in this case, we have three different uh, kinds of gates, which are the ones I mentioned before. A trigger, well, the names are not yet uh, very final, right? It, they are just the names I could came with. Um, so the trigger is to execute the method remotely and get a result, basically. A mirage is to execute the actually to simulate the execution in, in our local image with our local implementation of the remote class of the object. And finally, we have direct gates which simulate the execution of the remote object using the call of the remote object. But the simulation is done locally. There could be more. We could, for example, I don't know, simulate the execution remotely with our local code, or I don't know. So these are the ones that I think are more interesting. Uh, let's see uh, them in, in a little more detail. Here we have a trigger. So when the trigger uh, is sent the message sum, sum, it doesn't understand it, so it resends that message to the trigger. The trigger is going to execute it remotely. To do that, it's going to do something like this, right? It's going to get the message. It's going to save the context in the remote image. Saving the context means saving the states of the registers. Or, um, basically that. You could save the context like the memory, but that wouldn't scale. Um, what you're going to do is to place all the arguments in the remote stack, place a, a return address, which is going to be maybe a, a stub or something that you create so that you can come back. Finally, set the instruction pointer to your lookup mechanism. And finally, run that code. Let, let the VM run, the remote VM. So when the VM returns, it's going to probably create a new exception or something like that so that you can know that it ran and you can restore the context, the original context, but you get the result back. So that's basically the, the way it works. And we have in the, this, which is the mirror, which is in cell, if you, if you look back, we have in the trigger, we didn't have any instance variable, and now we are adding the, the class of the remote object, which we can get using a mirror, its structural information. And now if we have the class of the object, but it's the local class of the object, we can look, when receiving the message sum, we can go to our local class and ask it for the compiled method that we are going to need. Uh, with, that method, with that method, we can simulate or interpret the execution of that method, right? And then we can uh, actually this will go. This is going to trigger a lot of uh, simulations because this method could send more messages, and those messages are going to be simulated. Uh, and after some simulation, you will get a result. Um, finally, we have these, which are the direct. Uh, gates, which are very similar, but in this case you don't have the, the class of the, the local class, the local version of the class of the remote object. 
And in this, in this case, it's, the code is very similar to the previous one, but instead of adding, um, of adding the, the class of the receiver to the direct gate, we are asking the remote runtime to give us, to do lookup of the remote object in the remote object. And so when we can get the source code of that object using mirrors, we can simulate it. Perfect. And basically, that's the whole framework. Um, so what were we doing with this? We, we had some applications. The first one was to uh, create a debugger for our remote image. Um, basically, it's a, it's a basic debugger for now, very, very basic. Uh, it only shows your stack trace. Shows you, it can also show low-level details like the state of the registers, but the most interesting information that is shown is that you have the, the stack trace of the methods that made the VM crash. And if you see in the, in the screenshot, we are showing there the method definition, and that method definition is going to be the one of the remote image. And to get that method definition, we are using uh, these kind of gates and, sub and subjects to find all the information. Because accessing source code, for example, is a very hard procedure if you were using mirrors, simple mirrors, because your instance variables don't have the source code. You have to execute code to get the source code, right? So um, it's not that easy. And after that, we also did a profiler so that we can scan the stacks from time to time and see um, what's going on there and uh, count every, every activation of the methods we, we find and do some statistics about that and optimize. Uh, well, that's most of it. We have different backends. Uh, the first one was, uh, it's the, the most um, complete one, which is for the Windows debugging app API. And we also have two more, which are one for GDB, but it's not really for GDB machine interface, which is a binary format, which is very good and fast, but it's only a hack. Um, the same for, for Box. And actually, these two, I'm going to, to show a bit now. Uh, they use, we are parsing the output of those programs and simulating that we are sending commands through the command line and reading the, the output. Um, okay, so finally, this, this work I, I implemented, I presented a work, a, a paper, a working process paper um, in Splash Conference uh, in Meta uh, Workshop. Uh, we did this with Stefan Mar. Um, so I'm going to show a little, a little demo of some application, okay? And that will be all. So let me check. Okay, yeah, no, because you didn't see it, but uh, be crashed. So I, I'm, recovering, I'm recovering the changes while you don't see it. Okay. Uh, I, I remember your demo, so you shouldn't say anything. Okay, I tried to recover the changes, so I'm not sure if it will work, but let's see. Is automatic. Well, it didn't work, I remember. <laughs> so. I 
I'm actually not not seeing anything, but I think it's yeah, it's okay. So, do you read anything there or no? So, okay, I did netcat, which is like uh, sending the output and input of the console to to a TCP port, and I'm going to connect through B. And well, let me see because I don't see in the in the big screen. Okay, it's there. Do you, did you, any of you hear about squeak nose? Any? Okay, sometime. It's a, well, okay. Squeak nose is an operating system written all in small talk. And so this year, one of the things we, we have been doing is converting that, uh, the, the C parts to a library that you can link to any process. And so the idea was to try to make it work in, in B. So if this works, Okay. Oh, you are not seeing it, but here it is. So we basically made uh, B work basically, very basically, in uh, in the same sense that than uh, than Squeaknos. So we can use our debugger to debug a Linux, a Linux running on box. So it. So that's B. Running. That's B running, booting. booting without an operating system. And I'm going to move it now. And we are, what we are seeing here in this screen is the debugger, which is connecting to the remote B, running on the virtual uh, PC that is running its code. And we are seeing here the SAC. And we could see, for example, the call, and if this works, we are using, yeah, we are seeing the call of the remote image in our local image, and we could maybe debug it. And what, if you could read, it's trying to do FFI, which of course doesn't work, and that's most of it. So thank you very much. If you have any question, okay. Okay, thank you.